my work. Oh, I didn't hurt anything. Well, now, what's going on? Teacher's taking some old pictures. They're not just old pictures. I have to be very careful of them. My teacher only owned them to me overnight. Besides, you better not have crash landings if you want to be a senior pilot like Daddy when you grow up. Anne's got a mighty fine point there, son. You better take her advice. What are the pictures for, honey? Well, we're studying different kinds of fruits and vegetables school. It's supposed to make up a notebook on juices. See all the material I collected? Mm -hmm. The story of fruit and vegetable juices, I'm calling it. But I don't like that title very much. It doesn't have any, oh, you know, glamour to it. <laughs> Well, maybe we can get a better idea for your title from some of the material you have here, honey. What have you got? Oh, first of all, I'm telling all about the early history of oranges. Oh? That's where the drawings came. Let me show them to you. Say, this is beautiful. What's that supposed to be? It looks like a Chinese palace. It is, Daddy. That's part of the Emperor Tai Yu. Uh -huh. Here's what my notes say. The orange was first mentioned in history about 4,000 years ago. It originated in southern China and northern India. And this one shows how the orange moved south through India. The Hindus carried them in their ox carts. Too bad they didn't have airplanes in those days. Would have gotten there a lot faster. Oh, swine. Yes, <laughs> much faster. Then it says the Arabs took oranges from India over to southwest Asia. See this one? These Arabians are carrying oranges on a caravan trip through the Middle East with all the fruit loaded on their camels. People who lived on the subshores of the Mediterranean grew oranges for hundreds of years before the Crusaders brought them into other parts of Europe. And the first orange seeds are supposed to have come over to America with Christopher Columbus for sailing. This one I'm working on this shows when other explorers came over a lot later, they found orange trees going wild in Florida. So naturally, they thought the fruit was to this country. They didn't know then that orange trees can live and bear fruit for years and years. That's right, Anne. And you know, all during that time, the tree never rests. You'll see ripe fruit on the same tree with newly opened blossoms. And then pretty soon, those blossoms become oranges too. I learned quite a bit about fruits and vegetables in agricultural college. Well, that was back in the days before I decided to become a pilot. Gee, Daddy, that's great. Maybe you could help me with a notebook. <laughs> oh, you want to put the old man to work, eh? Well, it should be a lot more fun than some of those arithmetic problems we've had lately, huh, Ned? What do you want to know? Well, first show me how to draw blossoms on this orange tree I'm copying. Oh, that's a cinch. Ned, run out in the kitchen and ask your mother for a can of orange juice, will you? Okay, Dad. I think there's a pretty good picture of an orange blossom on one of those cans we bought today. Gee, Daddy, why didn't I think of that? Probably because you didn't bring the groceries in from the car. I did. Okay, what's next? Well, we haven't gotten very far. Let's see. I was going to tell how fruits are grown next. You know, where they grow best and all that. Oh, well, that's easy, too. Right here in the United States. We grow more oranges, lemons, grapefruit, and other citrus fruits than any other nation. In fact, I understand it's the biggest agricultural industry in Florida and California. Texas grows a lot of grapefruit for juice, too, and so does Arizona. Couldn't those fruit trees grow anywhere people wanted to plant them in this country? Afraid not, Anne. You've got to have the right climate, for one thing. Very little cold weather and lots of warm sunshine. That's the only way to grow. Soil is mighty important, too. Why, even in Florida, the light, sandy soil has to be carefully cultivated so they can grow hardy fruit trees. And also, seeds have to be selected very carefully. They have to be sure to plant the kind that will grow well in this type of soil. <laughs> oh, but nature's got a lot of tricks up her sleeve. Even with the right climate, good soil, and the right seeds, growers have still another problem. All these things may grow a fine tree all right, but it's not always one which gives the best oranges. So the growers outsmart nature like this. Well, trees from their selected seed has grown enough, so each tree has a strong set of roots and is budding well. They cut a small branch with lots of buds on it from a healthy tree which they know produces a lot of fine oranges. 
Then with a sharp knife, they carefully slit the bark of a young tree near the ground. Cut a bud from the branch that came from the heavy bearing tree. And slide this bud into the slit good and tight. Over this graft, they wrap a special tape for protection. Now, after the tape has been removed and the bud has taken, which means it has started to become a healthy branch of the tree, the top of the tree is cut off. Then when this branch has grown out a little more, it's trained up to act as the trunk of what will become a new tree. A year or so later, the tree with its sturdy, strong roots and a trunk borrowed from a tree that bears well, is ready for transplanting to a grove, where in a few more years, it'll start bearing tasty, juicy fruit. Provided, of course, the water supply is watched carefully and growers make sure the trees are properly irrigated. And by regular sprayings, they keep their trees and the fruit free from insects which might harm them. They also protect them from cold if necessary. Sometimes they warm the air near the trees with heating units when the temperature gets close to freezing as it does once in a while on winter evenings. And in some places, they use large wind machines to circulate the air over the grove and keep the trees and the fruit warm. You've heard a lot in school, Ann, about vitamins, minerals, and carbohydrates. Well, oranges are packed with all these, plus fruit sugars that give us energy. They naturally have the greatest amount of these when they're ripened on the tree and picked at the peak of their goodness. Like any fruit, though, the orange is perishable when picked fully ripe, and it has to be eaten or canned within a short time. One of the most interesting parts of my college work was to follow through from the time they loaded the trucks in the orange groves, on through the canning process. One of the men told me that the oranges they use for canned juice can stay on the tree right up to the moment they're ripest. Because the cannery is usually only a short distance from the groves, so there's no delay in getting the juice in cans once the fruit is picked. And with orange juice so popular these days, more and more of the crop is going into canned juice. Let me tell you how they do it. Cannery. The oranges are unloaded from big trailer trucks onto a conveyor. This sometimes takes them into storage bins just temporarily. Or it carries them right on through a cleaning and inspection process. After they've been cleaned thoroughly and had a careful check for quality, they roll along to what are called the juice extracting drums. Here, they roll into cups on the drums, just the right size to hold them, and are sliced in half as the drums go around. On similar drums, underneath these, are some in each half of the orange and squeeze out the juice. Then it pours a stainless steel through machines which strain out the pulp and seeds. And these, along with the peels, are used to make fine cattle food. Now, that's one way I've seen canners extract the juice. However, another cannery I went through once used extractors that hold the orange in one half, almost like a hand, while the other half comes down under pressure and squeezes out the juice. In this method, a little tube under each orange being squeezed punches a hole in it, and as pressure is applied to the orange, the juice goes down through this tube and out into a trough which takes it to other processing machines. Oh, it really makes you thirsty when you see large stainless steel tanks in the mix full of freshly ex... Some is sweetened here for folks who like it that way. And some is blended with grapefruit juice, which makes another wonderful drink. And from here, the juice disappears to large tanks where they take out the excess air it picked up when being squeezed. 
They told me that if the oxygen in this air was allowed to remain, it might react with elements in the juice to reduce its flavor and lower its vitamin content. Then the juice is piped quickly into pasteurizing machines where it's heated to destroy any enzymes and spoilage bacteria. But of course, not enough to destroy its flavor or goodness. Now the juice is all ready to be canned. You know, the skin of the orange is nature's way of preserving all the goodness of the fruit until it ripens on the tree. Then when it's picked, it has to be used in a short time. But man has improved on nature. He's provided a container in which all that goodness can be sealed in indefinitely, or at least until we are ready to enjoy it. That's what canning really means to everyone. And is it fast? Why, the modern machines canners use fill and hermetically seal juice in cans as fast as you can blink your eyes. Here's a can you wanted, Dad. Thanks, son. But it's empty. Yes, I see who emptied it. <laughs> Partially responsible for the great expansion of the fruit and vegetable industry in this country, giving support to hundreds of thousands of people. Also making it so easy for people all over the world to enjoy fruit juices whenever they want them. Look, here's an orange blossom you can copy in your notebook. Oh, it's perfect. And you're right about them growing oranges for juice in California, Daddy. It says that's where this juice came from. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. I wonder how it works out there. Well, the Spaniards settled both in Florida and California. So I guess the orange went both places with them. However, growing oranges in both states is pretty much the same, even though they do have mountains in different soil conditions in California. California also grows other fruits for canned nectars that are mighty good to drink, like apricots, pears, and peaches. I'll tell you another mighty interesting thing about this business of canning juices. Even though it's comparatively young, some amazing things have been done in recent years so that more juice can get to more people. For instance, frozen concentrated orange juice, like several other juices that are concentrated, canned and frozen, is juice from which a lot of the natural water has been removed. Of course, it must be kept under refrigeration, but when it's canned, it needs much less shipping space to market. When you want to serve it, you just put the water back in again. Stir it well, and presto, you've got wonderful tasting orange juice. Delicious lemonade is made the same way. Don't you remember seeing Mother do it? Oh, sure, lots of times. Which reminds me, let's go see how dinner's coming along. Yeah, I'm starved. Are you all getting hungry? Well, I'm in no hurry, but I am thirsty. You mind? Not at all. Have your pineapple juice now, Anne. It'll save putting it on the table. Well, I see you already have your favorite juice, young man. <laughs> Anne, put these cans in the refrigerator, will you? Okay, Mother. Gee, this family certainly likes a lot of different juices, Mother. Well, I can't think of a better way for us to get some of the vitamins and minerals we need every day. Daddy, is the grapefruit a lot older than the orange? It's sure a lot bigger. <laughs> it's probably the same age, Anne. But it's only been grown in this country about a hundred years. And it's been grown commercially fewer years than that. Large quantities of grapefruit first came on the market after some severe frosts practically put the orange out of business. Back in the 1890s, I think it was. Growers tell me they were originally called the Shaddock, after the man who introduced them to this country. But their popular name, grapefruit, is gotten from their habit of growing in clusters, somewhat like grapes. That grapefruit juice mother's drinking was probably squeezed in the same way as the orange juice. Fact is, grapefruit was the first to be commercially processed for juice. Just like the orange, it's rich in the important vitamin C, and naturally very good for it. And it tastes good, too. So does this pineapple juice. Bet you don't know who discovered the pineapple, Daddy. Oh, yes, I do. Well, the same man who discovered the Hawaiian Islands, old Captain Cook. Captain Cook? Uh -huh. Oh, no, Daddy. The pineapple is supposed to have been there already. Oh. 
In school, we were told pineapples are native to South America. And that there's an old story that some Spanish ships full of pineapples were shipwrecked near Hawaii, and some of the fruit floated ashore on the island. Sure. I remember now. The pineapple did originate in, in Brazil, I think it was. Yeah, the natives called it nana, meaning fragrance. Then, as you say, there are lots of stories about how it got to Hawaii. But anyway, today, raising pineapples is one of their most important industries. The fruit is also grown in Puerto Rico, Mexico, Cuba, and several other places. I remember when I was based in Hawaii, noticing how carefully they cultivated the fields. Sugar cane is planted in the lowlands, and pineapple in the higher fields. After the ground is cultivated, rolls of mulch paper, which is very much like a light roofing paper, are laid down in rows. And the pineapple plants are put in the ground through holes made in the paper. This paper keeps in the moisture, and it regulates the temperature and keeps weeds from growing. Then follows about a 20 to 22 month growing period. Rain and lots of sprayings help to keep the plants healthy. Pineapples are not grown from seed, but from slips that grow near the base of the fruit, from suckers that are lower down on the stem of the plant, or from the crown on the top of the pineapple. About 20 months after planting, the ripe fruit is ready for harvest. Each plant will produce another pineapple one year later, and then the field is plowed under and allowed to rest. Ripe pineapples are wonderful tasting, but if they pick them when they're completely ripe, pineapples will spoil in a short time, or rather would spoil if it weren't for the canning process. Today, the fruit that canners use for juice has been fully ripened in the fields. This way, it has the most fruit sugars and the finest flavor, and when picked, they're quickly moved to the cannery nearby. During the season, thousands and thousands of pineapples pour into the cannery every day. There, an ingenious machine known as the Janaka peels the fruit so that the juice, like you're drinking now, Anne, can be easily extracted. Then it's pasteurized, like other juices, sealed in our house. Say, Ann, you better not leave this juice out of that notebook, honey. Tomato juice was one of the very first juices to be introduced. And tomatoes are grown in all parts of the country. Hey, Ned, remember last year we had them in our garden? Yes, but they weren't juice tomatoes. The only way we got them was in our salad. <laughs> Dear, it's a lot more convenient for us to get our tomato juice in cans all ready to serve. But maybe Daddy will plant more this year. Squeeze some for you. Oh, I'd never be able to turn out the wonderful tomato juice that canners do. Not from my little garden. Why, in the big growing areas, they plant tomatoes with a machine, like a tractor. A man sits on each side of it, down almost at ground level, where he can place young plants in the soil at just the right distance apart as it moves along. At the same time, the machine neatly fills in the soil around each plant, and also gives it a squirt of water and sometimes fertilizer. Then they're all set to start growing. Plants like that grow perfectly right along the ground and with proper care, in a few months will be loaded with ripe red tomatoes. If these tomatoes are for canned juice, growers can let them fully ripen on the vine so they'll have the most flavor and food value and pick them at just the right moment for trucking to a cannery near. It's quite an interesting sight to see thousands of these fully ripe tomatoes being unloaded at a cannery into a water-filled trough in which they float from the unloading platform right into the plant. Inside, they first get a really thorough cleaning, of course, and then are carefully checked for quality as they ride along an inspection belt. Next, the whole tomato is passed along to other machines where all its goodness is pressed into liquid form. From what are called holding tanks, this juice is drawn off to be pasteurized the same as other juices, and then filled and sealed quickly in the cans. All this in a matter of only a short time after the tomatoes were judged just right for picking. Well, kids, I've talked myself right into another glass. I'll get it for you, Dad. Would you have some, too? 
Why, sure, Sam. Get him a clean glass, Ann. I like all kinds of juices. Oh, you do? Well, I'm glad to hear you say that, young man. Because they're all rich in the food values we need to stay healthy. No matter how young or old we are. Say, you know, Ann, it seems to me the title you want for that notebook of yours should express what canned fruit and veggies mean to us and to people all over the world. Don't forget, besides these juices we've been drinking, there are lots of other kinds to enjoy. Made from grapes, apples, prunes, and several kinds of vegetables. And just think how convenient and helpful it is for us to have all the vitamins and natural goodness of these fruits and vegetables extracted for us, canned, and then practically flowing into our own home like a lot of rivers anytime we want them. Why, that's it. Why don't you call your notebook on juices, Vitamin Rivers? Oh, Daddy, that's a wonderful idea. Mm -hmm.